Welcome to lesson zero of the PGM Scheduling School. This is a lesson that is going to lay the framework for this scheduling course. For some of you, this lesson is going to be a review or refresher of old information. Or, for others of you, this is going to be brand new. Wherever you are in your scheduling knowledge, this lesson will ensure that you and I are on the same page and speaking the same language. So let's start with a brief history of scheduling and project planning. Scheduling and project planning dates all the way back to ancient times, but we'll skip ahead and start in the 1900s with the creation of the Gantt chart. Henry Gantt and Frederick Taylor designed a graphical way to view a project's work and progress by showing each activity represented as a bar, and where the length of that bar represents the duration of that activity. This was an excellent way to track progress and show when planned work was scheduled to occur but it did not show the interrelationships between each activity and how each one could impact the other. Let's fast forward to the 1950s when the DuPont Chemical Company was looking for a better way to manage the interrelationships between the activities on their projects. Enter the critical path method, or CPM scheduling for short. This method is a mathematical way to show the relationships between activities and how by delaying or accelerating one activity, it will have an impact on the rest of the project. Let's take a look at a really simple example of a project schedule. Say I want to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have the bread which is in the refrigerator. I have the jelly which has been sitting out on the counter and is room temperature. And I don't have any peanut butter so I'll have to run to the store to get it. So in order to make my sandwich, I'm a very picky eater. So I need to get my jelly to a nice cool temperature of 48 degrees. I also need to go get my peanut butter from the store, then I can come home and make my sandwich. Say my jelly was going to take 20 minutes in the refrigerator to cool down to the temperature that I wanted, but it was going to take me an hour to run to the store and back and get my peanut butter. Let's map this out. Say I immediately put my jelly in the refrigerator at 5 p.m. and it took me one minute to do that. Keep in mind that it's going to take 20 minutes to cool down. After I put my jelly in the refrigerator, I left for the store and it took me one hour to get my peanut butter and then get home. Once I got home, it took me five minutes to make my sandwich. So by the time I'm ready to eat my sandwich, it's 6.06 .06 p.m. That's the one minute for the jelly, plus one hour for the peanut butter, plus five minutes for making the sandwich. The jelly was able to cool down as I was gone getting the peanut butter. We can see from this flow of work that I can't leave the house to get my peanut butter until I put the jelly in the fridge. And I can't make my sandwich until I have my peanut butter. But now, say my sister Kimberly is at the house and she said she could put the jelly in the fridge for me so I wouldn't have to worry about it. Well now, I could leave the house immediately and shave off a whole minute so I could potentially eat my sandwich at 6.05. I get out on the road and I call her at 5.30 to remind her to put my jelly in the refrigerator, but she doesn't answer. I keep calling, but she's not picking up. Finally, at 5.50, as I'm on my way home, I get a hold of her and she said she's just putting the jelly in the fridge. Well, this is just great. Now I'll be home at 6 o'clock, but the jelly won't be cool until 6.10 because it takes 20 minutes to cool and it's 550 right now. So conceptually, you can see the relationships between the activities in this project. And intuitively, you are probably already figuring out how by rearranging one of these activities or delaying another would impact the project. But with the critical path method of scheduling, we can now see how the relationships look on paper. Let me introduce you to the PERT diagram box. This box represents one activity and is meant to help us calculate how long our project will take and how long we can delay certain activities without impacting the overall project completion. Here's how this works. The top row of this box is broken down into three smaller boxes, the early start, the duration, and the early finish. The middle row just represents the activity name and a unique identifier. And the bottom row is broken down into the late start, total float, and late finish. Don't be intimidated by these fancy terms. I'll explain. Think of a series of four activities where each activity has a relationship to one another. 
So this first activity is a predecessor to these other two activities, meaning that the first activity has to finish before the other two activities can start. And these two activities are both predecessors to this fourth activity. Now, notice how this third activity finishes well ahead of when the fourth activity is scheduled to start. So with the critical path method of scheduling, we can see that this activity has the ability to slide back and forth without impacting the start of the next activity. So the dates for this activity are different from what we're used to, such as a calendar, which only has the date that something begins and the date that something finishes. This type of a schedule has the ability to shift and change dates. The dates in a CPM or critical path method schedule can be broken down into two types. The earliest, most optimistic dates for when the activity could start or finish, and then the latest or most pessimistic dates for when the activity needs to start or finish by before it impacts the next activity. Now, float represents the amount of time that this activity could be delayed without impacting the next activity. I don't want to cause too much confusion, but there are two types of float, independent float and total float. Independent float is the amount of time that an activity can be delayed without impacting the next activity. Total float is the amount of time that an activity can be delayed before it starts impacting the completion of the whole project. During our time together, uh, whenever I talk about float, I'm using it in the context of total float. So the amount of time that an activity can be delayed before it starts impacting the whole project. Let's map out our sandwich project using this method to understand what these labels mean. With our first scenario, we were putting the jelly in the refrigerator ourselves, so that will be our first activity. The early start for this activity was 5 p.m., which simply means that this activity can't start any earlier than 5 p.m. The duration is one minute, and then the early finish is simply the early start plus the duration. So 5.01 p.m. is our early finish. This activity precedes two other activities, leaving to get our peanut butter and letting the jelly cool in the refrigerator. So let's start with letting the jelly cool. The earliest we can start allowing the jelly to cool is 5.01 p.m. So our early start for the letting the jelly cool is equal to the early finish of the last activity. The duration for letting the jelly cool is 20 minutes, so the early finish is the early start of 501 plus the duration of 20 minutes, which equals 521. Now, let's look at picking up the peanut butter. We can start picking up the peanut butter at 501. It's going to take one hour to pick up so 501 plus the duration gives us an early finish time of 601 p.m. Now, making our sandwich is really tied to both our peanut butter and letting the jelly cool. We can't start making the sandwich until both of those are complete. So the earliest we can start making our sandwich is whichever one of these activities finishes last. In this case, getting the peanut butter finishes at 601 p.m., so we can't start making our sandwich any earlier than that. So our early start for making our sandwich is 6.01 p.m. Then it will take five minutes to make our sandwich, leaving us with an early finish date of 6.06 .06 p.m. In scheduling terms, we've just calculated the forward pass of our critical path. We have to perform our backwards pass in order to calculate the late start, total float, and late finish of each activity. We'll start by going to our last activity and making the late finish equal to the early finish. If you think about it, this activity can't finish any later than the early finish because it's the last activity in the whole project. So we start by making the late finish equal to the early finish. In order to find our total float for this activity, we subtract the early finish from the late finish. In this case, 606 minus 606 is zero. So this activity has zero minutes of float. Think of float as how much time an activity can be delayed before it starts delaying the whole project. It's kind of like a fuse on a stick of dynamite. The longer the fuse, the more time you have before the dynamite blows up. 
So now, in order to find our late start for this activity, we take the late finish minus the duration. In this case, 606 minus five minutes equals 601 p.m. This is awesome. All of the information we need for this activity is filled out. Now we have to work our way backwards to fill in the other activities. We can start with our peanut butter activity. In this case, the late finish of the peanut butter activity is equal to the late start of the make sandwich activity, which in this case is 6.01 p.m. The total float for the peanut butter activity is equal to the late finish minus the early finish, or 6.01 minus 6.01, which is zero minutes. And the late start is equal to the late finish minus the duration, which is 5.01 p.m. Let's look at the cool jelly activity now. The late finish is equal to the late start of the make sandwich activity, which is 6.01. The total float is equal to the late finish minus the early finish, or 6.01 minus 5.21, which is 40 minutes. So notice that the float in this activity is different than the other one. What that means is this activity can be delayed by 40 minutes before it starts delaying the completion of our sandwich project. So now, in order to find our late start, again, it's our late finish minus our duration, which is 601 minus 20 minutes, which is 541. So now I know that the latest I can put the jelly in the fridge in this sequence is 541. If I wait until after 541 to put the jelly in the fridge, I'm going to get hangry. All right, we're almost done with our backwards pass. Let's look at our first activity. The late finish is equal to the earliest of the late starts between what I would call the downstream activities. So the late finish for my first activity is 5.01 p.m. because that is earlier than 5.41 p.m. The total float is the late finish minus the early finish. So 5.01 minus 5.01, which is zero minutes. And the late start is the late finish minus the duration, which is 5.01 minus one minute which equals 5 p.m. Our backwards pass is complete. So why in the world did we do all of that? Schedules used to be calculated by hand this way, and they were done so because this allows us to find what's called the longest path on the project. And simply put, the longest path is the sequence of activities where if we delayed even one activity in that sequence, it will push out the project completion. So let's look at our PERT schedule. We can see that the longest path on our project starts with putting the jelly in the fridge, then moves to going and getting our peanut butter, and then to making our sandwich. Those all have zero minutes of float. If I were to delay any one of those activities in that sequence, it will directly impact when I can eat my sandwich. I have some good news for you. You won't have to do these calculations anymore because with modern scheduling software, these calculations are done for you. But it is really, really important that you know the meanings of the early start, early finish, duration, late start, total float, and late finish. Those definitions are fundamental to scheduling. In our next video, we'll jump into P6 and I'll show you how to log in and give you an overview of the user interface. See you there.